First reading is from the first book of Chronicles, chapters 15 and 16. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of units of a thousand went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. Because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. Now David was clothed in a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark, as were the musicians, and Kenaniah, who was in charge of the singing of the choirs. David also wore a linen ephod. So all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of ram's horns, and trumpets, and of cymbals, and the playing of lyres and harps. That day, David first appointed Asaph and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Israel, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Jesus went out ahead, going up to Jerusalem, when he had come near Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a coat that has never been written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, <coughs> why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the cold, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones Picture it, a bunch of families meeting in a school gymnasium, a brand new church. Some of these people were native Pacific Northwesterners, but most of them had come from someplace else. They knew what church was supposed to be about because they'd all been to churches back home. Pews, organs, stained glass windows, carpet, straight rows, a pulpit, a proper altar. But in moving to this part of the country, they'd also become pioneers. They'd recreated themselves. People do that when they move here. 
I think it's something about the freshness of the air. You look at all the trappings and baggage that weigh you down and you ask, why? And then you reach for what life could be like and everybody says, why not? They called Jim Gilliam to come and be their minister and he and his family joined them there in the school. If ever there was a God-given leader for a moment in time, this was it. He held them to the only thing that mattered, the mission of God. And this was new to a lot of them. You'd think that church was always about the mission of God, but we are easily sidetracked to the point that we need reformations frequently just to bring us back to what we're supposed to be about. The mission of God, that's love. Love for hurting people around us. Love of healing and drawing us into Christ-likeness. Love speaking into the issues of the day. Love making space and time for deeply human things to happen. None of that requires a church building. It absolutely doesn't require any of the fittings, the pews and the organ and so forth. Jim Gilliam wouldn't let them relax into worship that was blinkered or self-serving. If it wasn't about God, he wasn't interested. And under his leadership, a people evolved who could ask new questions. Where is love calling us? What does God need us to be? Where is the here and nowness of the, of the work of the Spirit? And how can we be part of it? They prayed. And they went out and they talked to people, civic leaders, the police and fire departments, the schools, of course, that was easy. They brought their findings back and they prayed some more. All the time, their numbers were growing. Visions like that are contagious. Few people coming in the door of the, of the gym would always assume that eventually this congregation planned to have its own building. Uh, it was almost an initiation rite, disabusing them of that assumption. Gilliam preached about the dangers of going the church building route. Buildings suck you dry. All your money to start with. Your time, your energy, your focus. They need an everlasting amount of maintenance. And they have an insidious way of defining the boundaries of what's possible and what isn't. So that if you're not careful, you find the building setting the agenda instead of you setting it. The congregation heeded the message. They internalized the warning. They agreed that they wouldn't have a building until it was clearly the right thing to do. And maybe never. Never would be okay. The result of that caution is this extraordinary place. I fell in love with it from 6,000 miles away through the photographs on the website before I even met any of you. And then I met you and encountered that spirit, open and affirming, of course, how could you be anything else? Always looking beyond the walls, especially into the eyes of the homeless. Faith that would rather believe nothing than believe in the wrong things. A hunger for discussion about what faith means in the issues of the day. Looking for spiritual integrity that you could take with you to all the other places you go. In your despondent moments, you say, look around, everybody's old here. Uh, to which I always have two responses. A, it's not true. And B, what amazing old people. <laughs> what a privilege to be with them. We who are younger need to realize that we stand on the shoulders of giants. I would love to have a collection of Jim Gilliam's sermons. I haven't got one, but I have no doubt whatever that he preached on the texts that we've read today. In Chronicles, we read about the Ark of the Covenant coming home to Jerusalem, David's own city. The Ark was the box where they kept the stone tablets that Moses brought down from the mountaintop, the ones with the Ten Commandments on them. They thought of that box as God's throne, wherever it sat, and here it was coming to Jerusalem. David is dressed in his best clothes, at least to start with, and all the people are there. But it isn't enough to welcome the ark with pomp and ceremony. David gets them singing. We heard a bit of the song they sang that day. 
and David himself dances. He can't contain himself. He's leaping and spinning and clapping his hands and grabbing the priests to twirl them around. Somewhere in the midst of that, the clothes get lost, but it's okay. Kings are supposed to be uh, dignified, but it's not a day for dignity. It's, it's like um, he just can't cope with all the joy inside. Give thanks to the Lord, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Give thanks to the Lord. When the Ark of the Lord came to Jerusalem, it didn't fetch up in a temple. There wasn't any temple, not for another couple of generations. They put it in a tent. And if you know the story, you'll recall that God was not at all keen on the idea of a temple. God resisted it for a long time and only agreed after all kinds of persuading and then reluctantly, for all the reasons I've mentioned, buildings do funny things to people. Israel had been a people on the move. God didn't want them to get stuck. Now forgive me if I harangue just a bit more, but this is serious. In too many places, Christians are failing to be what disciples of Jesus should be because of buildings. You hear of ecumenical conversations that are going really well and then collapse. Nine times out of ten, it's because of buildings. You hear there's no money and no energy for mission because we're taking care of buildings. The Christian witness is not touching the community at all because the Christians are hiding in the buildings, let alone all the visitors who must be taught a lesson because they accidentally sit in somebody's seat. It's the worst of cliches, but it still happens. The children who mustn't run and the old people who are defeated by the stairs, let alone the impression we give with our moldering old signboards and our overgrown gardens. The building is here while the, well, the population has moved there, but we can't move. We have to stay with our building. There's heritage fossilized in our buildings, and it turns us into fossil keepers. So imagine if today had been our opening day, and we'd woken up to that rain. Wet feet are going to mess up our beautiful floors, our beautiful carpets. So many guests. What if they all come in with dripping umbrellas and they shake them and they leave them in the doorway? It's so perfect and we've worked so hard and now it's going to get wrecked. <coughs> Just want to step into Jim Gilliam's shoes and say it one more time. The moment church life is about a building, you're lost. It's over. I reckon that the souls of many Christians have been saved and lost through how they negotiate over the sharing of cupboard space. Who gets to use the good china and under what circumstances? Who dried their dishes and left the dish towels wet and dirty? Let alone who got paint on a table or used scotch tape on the wrong wall? I'd like to think that if Jim Gilliam is looking down on us today, seeing the kind of church we are, that he's smiling. We hardly ever fuss like that. This building has proclaimed God's welcome from day one. It has made all sorts of things possible that otherwise couldn't have happened. It's seen marriage vows and funeral tears. It has helped us lift our hearts to God, ours and everybody else's who comes here, whether for Scottish dancing or Hungarian food or orchestra rehearsal or a community meeting. This is God's place, not that God is confined here, but that God's spirit chooses to fill it. People can feel that. Which is where I want to bring our second reading into the conversation. Once again, the king is coming to Jerusalem. Once again, there are songs of praise and people jumping and waving with excitement. Once again, the keepers of public order are demanding that it be brought under control. But Jesus says something nobody expects. If these people were silent, he says, the very stones in the ground would cry out. And it makes me want to say to that pastor and that early congregation meeting in the school, don't worry so much. Don't be afraid. You're so focused on the dangers that you're forgetting something. Stones can sing. Stones can sing God's praises too. Stones can witness to spirit. Surely that happens here. 
Doesn't this place minister to our souls, quite apart from the words that are spoken here or the songs that are sung? I know about worship at school gymnasiums. Good things happen there. But when we're here, isn't there a whole new dimension, a whole other dimension to what we experience? And when we've turned out all the lights and gone home, doesn't the building's presence here speak of our existence, of love that cared enough to make doors you can walk through and hooks where you can hang your coat and spaces where you can bring your hungering and your curiosity and your searching and your gratitude and your need and your love? If this building has shaped us over the years, I believe it has shaped us for good. Its openness has encouraged us to be open. Its beauty has called out the beauty in us. Its flexibility has taught us to keep looking in new directions and not get stuck. Its acoustics have helped us find our common voice. It celebrates the fresh air that keeps all our souls alive. We are very blessed. So welcome back to our old timers. If life has taken you from here to other places, thank you for coming back to help us celebrate. Take our greetings to all those other places where you worship. And if you've been part of the mending and tending that have refreshed this place over the years, God bless you. If you feel the tug of the spirit in new directions, you are in the right place. At least I hope so, because we have a mighty tradition to live up to. Amen. Your offerings for the mission of God in this place will now be received.